Diagwitch everyone, Kajima Toshi, and welcome back to episode number 67 of the Inline G Flute Podcast with me, your host, motherfucking Inline G. Guys, you can tell by the, the tone of my voice and the expression on my face, this isn't going to be a happy episode this week. I'm very sorry. Genuinely, take my deepest apologies for this. I know you've come to expect a certain amount of entertainment, lightheartedness, and respite from the world in this podcast. It's not that this week. I'm really sorry. I'd actually written another episode entirely. I'd written a fashion episode. I think I even talked about it in last week's episode, saying that's what's going to come out this week. But the news in recent weeks has been too fucking much for me. It's been, ah, it's driving me mad. And to be honest, it's all I can think about. So it would feel very dishonest of me to not make this podcast. It's an episode that I've been trying to make for a while. I couldn't think of the words. I couldn't think of the ideas. I couldn't think of the structure. And to be honest, pushes came to shove this week. It went too far. Uh, There's been a lot in the news recently, so I'm going to give you guys a bit of context of what's coming up in this episode, context for the episode, and then we'll be getting on to some other things in it. We'll be covering a lot of topics today, but context first. Why am I feeling like this? Guys, if you watch news, so I am recording this podcast about three hours before it's due to come out. It's Thursday, the 10th of October right now. Generally, as you know, I don't like recording topical episodes in N9G because I think they should be timeless. You can listen to it at any time and go back and revisit the episodes. This is going to be a very strange episode to anybody not listening within the first week or so of this coming out because I'm sure it will get outdated very, 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 very quickly. But anyway, in the news recently, um, firstly, we had Israel's invasion of Lebanon recently. That happened a couple of weeks ago. And since then, we've seen a huge escalation in the situation in the Middle East. I'm not using the word conflict. I refuse to use it. But the situation in the Middle East has escalated deeply. Now, today has seen further news. In fact, not even today. The last hour has seen further news that has made me even more determined to write this podcast and change the script. So, originally, my script here that I writ two days ago says that the Irish news has been plastered with the information that the Israeli government has made threats against UN peacekeepers in southern Lebanon many of which whom are Irish. Now, that news has to be updated. Israel and the IDF have attacked UN peacekeepers in southern Lebanon. They have not, to this point, at 8.30 German time on Thursday, the 10th of October, attacked any Irish peacekeepers. However, there is an attack threatened on Camp Shamrock. A lot of UN peacekeepers are Irish. Now, for anyone who doesn't understand what the UN peacekeeping process is, it's essentially... It's an army or a militia, it's not an army, it's a militia group that are sent to conflict zones around the world. I think there's 13 peacekeeping missions at the minute around the world. I think five of them are in Europe, a couple in the Middle East. One of those is between the Israeli and Lebanese border. The role of UN peacekeepers is to go to conflict zones that are preparing for peace and essentially protect them. So there is one of those UN peacekeeping groups in southern Lebanon in some very small villages where the local people are at threat from both Israel, the IDF, and Hezbollah or Hezbollah. So it's a very volatile area that people can't protect themselves. So this small armed group is sent out there to keep the peace. They are not picking a side either way. They are sent by the UN. It's made up of soldiers from member states of the UN and they're paid by their country, not by the UN. Now Ireland has a very small military. We have like 7,000 people in our military. We haven't been in any active wars with the Irish military, obviously. So we're very active in the UN peacekeeping process and that program. So since 1958, Irish soldiers have been sent over regularly to the peacekeeping uh, program. So at the minute, there's a couple of Irish people over in Lebanon and Israel has told them to get out. The idea has told them to get out or they will be attacked and now attacks have started. Now, Michael D. Higgins, the Irish president, who is more of a figurehead than anything, but still the Irish president has strongly condemned the attack. And our Taoiseach, our Prime Minister, uh, Simon Harris, has went to America to chat to Joe Biden and make it very clear that Ireland will not stand for this and it is a violation of humanitarian law. Now this is all over the Irish news, lads. It's all over the fucking place and it is... I cannot tell you as an Irish person how fucking awful this is. Israel is a UN member state and it is attacking US peacekeeping troops. And as an Irish person that know that Irish soldiers might get killed now by Israel, this is too far. It's always been too far. It's been a shit show. Now, also, we've had in the last week, three days ago, we had the first year commemorations of the October 7th attacks by Hamas and Israel. So there's been a lot of things coming with that. Now, where this podcast came from, especially apart from today's news, where it really, I, where I really thought I have to do this this week, 
is from a sim uh, from a post by a symphony orchestra. In fact, the German symphony orchestra on October seventh, which really just threw this whole idea into my head. And I'm going to be talking a lot today about classical music journalism, the bias within it, and the fucking state of it. To be totally honest, it is a disgrace what's going on there. One person in particular. So let's strap in. This is going to be a wild ride. I am raw dog in this episode. I've got very little prepared in the sense of a linear structure. I've got facts, I've got things I've been thinking about, I've got a lot of things sort of noted down, but I don't know if there's going to be a structure, I don't know if there's going to be a result at the end of this, we're going through it together. Might not be your type of episode, if not, don't worry, come back next week. But I hope you listen about, okay? I'm going to talk about a lot of things, I will get to classical music, but I have to put a lot of context in place, okay? Please stay with me and listen to this episode, if there's any episode you should listen to, it's this one. Please, okay? Now, I will say also, lads, I'm very nervous about this episode, I'm not drinking alcohol, obviously. Um... I'm drinking a spetsy, zero, without sugar, because even sugar would send me over the edge. I'm nervous about this. I've been doing a lot of research into classical music institutions, orchestras. Uh, they're sponsored by a lot of very powerful people. And the more I researched into that and the further down the rabbit hole I went, the more nervous I've got about making this. So I'm also so aware that certain people will take clips of this episode and blow them widely out of context. And they'll accuse me of all kinds of things. You guys are listening from right now, you know the story. And listen, if you're listening now and you're the kind of person that is going to take this out of context, you're the kind of journalist that you know you're going to do that. You fucking know already. Fuck you. I actually don't give a fuck anymore. Do you know what? Fucking do it. People who listen to this podcast will know the truth, so you can go fuck yourself. Now, guys, we're going to get started, right? I'm going to do a little bit of a context on where this all came from for me, beyond what I said earlier. And then we're going to get into classical music, so hold on with me. So... Last year, on the October 7th, Hamas terrorists attacked a music festival in Israel. Now, that was October 7th last year. Since then, there has been a massive escalation in the situation in Israel and Palestine. Now, the latest death tolls, these are of yesterday. So, October 9th, I checked these. I'm sure they've changed a lot since then. But, as of yesterday, there have been 42,709 Palestinian killed. And there have been 1,000 139 Israelis that have been killed in the conflict. Now, I'm going to try and pull up a couple further figures here. Yeah, so I've got the figures here. Exactly. Now, these are, again, the latest figures that I can get. Uh, Yeah, I'll give you the killed ones. Now, of the 42,000, just over 42,000 Palestinians killed, uh, nearly 16,765 of those are children. Okay, and there has been injured almost 100,000 people. And there are more than 10,000 people missing. Now, obviously, for balance, in Israel, there has been just over 1,000 people killed and injured, 8,730. Now, a couple of figures on Gaza as well, just so we really put this into context. More than half of Gaza's homes have been damaged or destroyed. 80% of commercial facilities have been attacked. 87% of school buildings have been attacked. Healthcare facilities, so... 17 of the 36 hospitals are partially functional, 68% of road networks have been attacked, and 68% of cropland has been attacked. It is a fucking shit show. Now, the worst figure about that is, obviously, the 16,000 children that have died. It's it's honestly getting too depressed for me, lads. Now, there's been further escalation and atrocities, to be totally honest, committed by Israel, and those have taken place in Lebanon. So, bit of background on that, Israel and Hezbollah have been at war for a very long time, for decades and decades. Now, Hezbollah, let's get this very clear, are a militia, a resistance group, and also a political party. They have a political wing. Now, for full clarity, they have been designated fully or in part by 60 countries worldwide as a terrorist organization. Now, they did hold a majority in the Lebanese election, the fair and democratic Lebanese election. They did They didn't quite get the majority in the last elections in 2022, but since then there hasn't been a replacement government, so they're acting as caretakers. So they are still there in charge. In a fair and democratic election, they do have a political wing. Now, what you'll have probably seen in the news, especially recently, is the walkie-talkie or pager attack in Lebanon on the 17th and 18th of September. Now, quick disclaimer on this, the Israeli government has not officially taken credit for this attack yet, but a lot of analysts agree with them, and there were a couple of unnamed Israeli Uh, army officials as well as US defense officials who have confirmed this with various media outlets so it is as good as sure. Now basically what happened was 
There was a large delivery of walkie-talkie slash pager style devices to Hezbollah. They were used to communicate with each other and they were fitted with hidden explosives which were then detonated, essentially a Trojan horse. So Israel has delivered these booby trap pagers that were then set off at a certain time. Now they're set off together, rumours have it they were set off earlier than intended, but as they were set off it killed 32 people including two children. Bombs of these pagers have went off in markets, they have went off in housing buildings, they have went off in apartment blocks, one even went off in a car while the person was driving on a civilian road. Now let's be very clear about this, even if you're targeting terrorists, with what's happened with this, this is a war crime. Okay, Article 51 of the Geneva Convention states very clearly, indiscriminate attacks on a civilian population is a war crime. That is an indiscriminate attack on a civilian population. You knew they were going to go off in civilian areas and it's killed civilians. Um, now, in the last year, the most recent death toll of Lebanese people by Israeli forces is 2011. Now, over half of that is since these pager attacks a couple of weeks ago, with over 100 medical workers being killed as well. I, I'm not laughing at it, obviously. I'm laughing at the absurdity of this situation. Um, and a lot of news uh, outlets are reporting that these attacks are now, they're planned. They're deliberately targeting medical and first aid responders, the Israeli Defense Associate, or Force. So, this news has really prompted this episode, but... Um, it's one, it's one post in particular I talked about earlier that really got me going on Instagram, so we're going to talk about that now. So on the anniversary of the 7th of October attacks, uh, the Deutsche Symphony Orchestra made a post on Instagram. Now, be very clear about these attacks. Hamas attacked an Israeli music festival, Israeli civilians, and over 1,200 people were killed. That's fucking awful. And I'm going on record now to be very clear about this. I condemn it 100% fully. Killing civilians, don't do it. Right? Load of shit. Now... A lot of orchestras and Western institutions, classical music Western institutions, have not made statements on that anniversary a few days ago. They've said nothing at all. One did, and that is, as I said, the Deutsche Symphony Orchestra, or the Deutsche, the German Symphony Orchestra, essentially, out in Berlin. Now, they put up an Instagram post, just a simple picture with the date of October 7th, and they had a caption underneath. Now, it's quite a long caption. I've translated it into English. It was obviously in German originally. But I'll give you the gist of it, and I'll give you a few quotes from it. So it starts with, Today marks the anniversary of the horrible massacre committed by the terrorist organisation Hamas against Israel one year ago. Now, great. I totally support that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is a very poignant thing to say, very relevant, very respectful, and it should be said, in fact. Now, there's a couple of other things in it of that kind of tone. Um, nothing that's bothered me at all until this last sentence says, we strongly condemn the global rise of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiment over the past year. Never again is now. Now, the translation is that is nie wieder ist jetzt, which is never again is now. It was a slogan that became very popular in Germany after the Second World War to imply that uh, anti-Semitism and the rise of fascism should never happen again. It should be combated now at all times. So, you have to remember, when orchestras make these kind of statements, they're very carefully planned out. They will go through the desk of the CEO, the directors, the board. They'll go through certain players, prominent players. I'm sure the music director. Something of this magnitude will go past a lot of hands. A lot of people will have seen this. I don't think that's just thrown out. Now, I will say, they have disabled comments on this, and it did not get anywhere near the kind of likes that their posts normally get. Which, I think, for one obvious reason, we're going to talk about in a minute. It's a very, apart from that last sentence, it's a perfect post, but then at the last sentence, it starts to push, in my opinion, a political agenda through a chosen horse. So it's going to lead me to two points that I have to clarify very quickly. First, I'm sorry for all the clarification, lads, but we have to get through it. Um, we're going to talk about the word anti-Semitism. Okay, so if you're living in a Western country, okay, maybe even if you're living outside a Western country, you'll probably see a lot of headlines recently about the rise of anti-Semitism. Now, there's a few definitions of what anti-Semitism actually means, and it is incredibly difficult to encompass everything that's in there in one single definition. I've struggled to find a definition that I can use for this podcast that I feel encompasses everything, so in the end, I have just went to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. They have a whole page on this. You can Google it. It's fantastic. Um, 
very respected institution that's done obviously a huge amount of research into this topic and they have a definition for anti-semitism that they said should be used as a working thing so anti-semitism is a certain perception of jews which may be expressed as hatred towards jews rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-semitism are directed towards jewish or non-jewish individuals and or their properties toward jewish community institutions and religious facilities now essentially anti-semitism boils boils down to a hatred of jews simply for the fact that they are jewish now, as for the rise of anti-Semitism, I'm not going to comment on that because in my book, fucking no-brainer, no starter, fuck anti-Semitism, absolutely fuck it, I have no time for it obviously, and in my opinion there is zero space in the modern world for any form of anti-Semitism, I have the same attitude to racism, sexism, homophobia, the lot, okay, in my opinion the only thing you should judge anyone on is the strength of their character. I don't give a fuck in the best possible way. I don't give a fuck what colour your skin is. I don't give a fuck what you have between your legs. I don't give a fuck what pronouns you want. I don't give a fuck what religion you are. Fill your boots. Do your thing, okay? If you're not hurting anyone else, you can do whatever you want. I don't care in the best possible way. All I care about is how you are as a person. So, fuck anti-Semitism. Now, let's talk about anti-Israel. A separate thing. When I use the term anti-Israel, which I often do... For me, that is in reference to the Israeli government. So, obviously, the Prime Minister of Israel right now is Benjamin Netanyahu. That is, for me, I'm criticising the Israeli government. And in that regard, I am hugely anti-Israel. Now, having the, having the freedom to criticise a government is a cornerstone of Western democracy. In fact, I think you should do it. You should hold your government to account at all times. Not just your government. All governments should be held to account as much as possible. Now, we take this to Ireland, I have drawn comparisons between what's going on in Israel and what happened in Ireland many times. I've done, I've talked about it in certain episodes, you can go Google that. You, quickly, you'll have to read why Irish people like myself are so pro-Palestine in this. We see a lot of what's going on in that situation in our own history. We draw a lot of parallels with it, with British colonialism and what Israel is doing. So we really understand it. So I'm going to make a few comparisons in that sense. It's what I know, I'm from Belfast especially, so this is something that's very close to home for me. But you will often hear people in Ireland say things like, fuck the Brits, or get the Brits out of Ireland, or get your Brits out. Now, that doesn't mean contemporary British people or the British population, obviously. It means the British government, the British monarch, and the British military. All three of which are fair game. You can criticise the shit out of those three things, and you should, and I fucking do. Those three things are fair game to criticise. You can make, you can attack them as much as you want. They're elected, except for the monarchy, but that's half the reason why we do attack it. You should hold them to account, okay? Now, the same thing applies to Israel. Now, there are a lot of similarities, as I said, between Britain and Israel. I'm not going to go into that too far today. But, most important thing, being anti-Israel and anti-Semitic are two separate and exclusive things. They're totally different, okay? Now, here, I don't doubt there's probably plenty of anti-Semites out there who say they're anti-Israel and use it to push their agenda, or to cover themselves up, or to mislead, and fuck those guys, but they're two separate things, at the end, okay, so, for example, the same body I talked about earlier, so the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, have a huge article on the website on the definition of anti-Semitism, they give loads of examples, and it's almost an exhaustive list, in their opinion, of what, it, it's very, very good, you should really check it out, but even they say on it, criticism of Israel, similar to that level against any other country, cannot be regarded as anti-semitic now that's straight from the horse's mouth there lads so for the deutsche symphony orchestra to include the condemnation of anti-israel sentiment is purely political anti-semitism to say the word anti-semitism is not only sufficient but appropriate and you should say it because fuck anti-semitism if it's on the rise fuck it but being anti-israel is a political statement and bringing politics into this and throwing it in a Trojan horse and it into a very serious moment, a very serious crime, it made me lose my fucking shit, okay? They didn't need to do that. And blocking comments on it well was fucking cowardly. Fucking cowardly. Now, the media is portraying the Middle East in some very strange ways. And how they're portraying it is essential to how we're going to understand it. Classical music journalism is no different. And again, we are going to get to that. We're nearly there, okay? But first, I do just want to talk about the style of reporting we're seeing in regards to what's going on over there. And use it as a bit of context to explain what's going to happen later. Now, journalistic objectivity is a very important standard to uphold. 
essentially the press should be re regarded as what we call a fourth estate so a fourth estate is something it's a body that exists entirely separately from the government and large interest groups it's so important to a modern western democracy or any democracy to have freedom of the press the press should not be influenced by the government or large interest groups they are totally free it's essential to a democracy to have freedom of the press now the reporting on the middle east can vary widely because even some of our most trusted news sources can be a little bit sketchy and we will get to the classical music ones on that but before we do let's take as an example the bbc now the bbc are often viewed as the epitome of journalistic excellence renowned worldwide for being as close to unbiased as you can get they are incredibly respected now i've taken two headlines from the bbc website you can go check them from the last week one of them is regarding russia and one of them is regarding israel now see if you can spot the difference here the first headline three killed in russian airstrike on kharkiv apartment kharkiv being a city in ukraine so three killed in russian airstrike on kharkiv apartment the second headline is un refugee agency says staff among those who died in lebanon now can you see the difference here now it's a st it's a difference in writing styles and it's a perfect example of what we call in the media the active and the passive voice so the active voice is when somebody is doing something. So a really simple, boiled down example is Gareth is playing the flute. That is the active voice. The passive voice is when something is being done. The flute is being played by Gareth. Now an active voice is three killed in Russian airstrike on Kharkiv apartment. It says who did it, what happened, where it happened. Active. The passive voice is the second one. UN refugee agency says staff among those who died in Lebanon. Who died not killed doesn't say who did it there's no point in fingers it's they did they get murdered did they get killed or did they have a heart attack when it happened did they die in some kind of other way at the same time it deliberately misleads okay now the passive voice is the active voice first the active voice is strong it's punchy it's hard hitting it's direct generally in journalistic circles that is accepted to be the best way to write headlines in all newspapers unfortunately but all newspapers will have punchy, strong headlines to grab your attention, and then you go in and read it. Active voice. Almost in, almost entirely, almost uniquely the active voice. Now, the passive voice is used for certain things, but one of the ways it's most commonly used is to confuse or mislead intentionally. Now, perfect example is politicians. Politicians are masters of the passive voice. You'll hear it all the time. When you start noticing this, you'll knock it out of your fucking heads. Uh, a classic. You hear politicians always say this. Mistakes were made. They never say... I made mistakes. Mistakes were made. That is passive. It deliberately misleads. It leaves an implication that perhaps the mistakes weren't made by me. It changes it entirely without not taking the blame. It's a way to shift responsibility onto someone else, something else, or something unknown. Or to generally mask the whole thing. Politicians do it all the fucking time. When you start noticing the headlines around this, you'll notice it. Now, the BBC do it constantly, and the BBC are you know, respected. So you can imagine how it goes to everyone else. So, now we're going to get the classical music. Thank you for holding on to that. God, it's been a while already. 22 minutes. We're getting the classical music now. I hope that's enough background on it all. So, sources for classical music journalism beyond reviews or concerts are very few and far between, as you all know, I'm sure. But one of the biggest sources in the world, if not the biggest, and they claim they are the biggest, is Slipped Disc. And it's ran by the British journalist Norman Lebrecht. Now, I used to love Slip Disc because it was the only place that I could get news about the people involved in the classical music industry beyond reviews. I could hear a bit about who they're dating or what happened or what scandal happened. It was it was very interesting to me because these are people that I idolize as much as rock stars and pop stars and movie stars, but I had no opinion, had no information on their personal life. So I used to love it. It was the source that I went through for this and it was so much fun to read. Um, it's worth saying. Lebrecht's articles are shit. They've always been shit, but nobody's going to doubt this, okay? And Lebrecht himself wouldn't doubt this. Lebrecht actually used to write for the Daily Telegraph. Now, the Daily Telegraph back in Britain is known as a newspaper of record. Now, there's a couple of newspapers that have got that title, but essentially it's incredibly well respected. The newspaper of record is so well respected for its integrity and quality of journalism. So it's a newspaper of record, and Lebrecht was a music, editor, or a music writer there for a long time. Slip Disc is not that. Now, the average slip disc format, go onto the website, go to slipdisc.com or go to his Facebook page, go click any article, you'll get the same thing, okay? You'll get a two sentence introduction in a very active voice with a tabloid style headline and usually in that two sentence introduction to his first paragraph, you'll get a hyperlink to something, to another article from slip disc, you'll try to squeeze them in, get the clicks up boy. Then you'll get a new paragraph, usually it's a quote, it's a quote from 
a more reliable source or someone he knows or just pasted and then you'll get another paragraph with a send off usually with some bitchy remark or some sly remark and that's the format it's very very short articles you can read them in seconds very 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 short if it's not the only thing that will lengthen out a slip disc article is going to be the middle section if, the, if he's quoting a statement he might quote the entire statement but usually we're talking four to five sentences max for an article now this is textbook tabloid journalism it's a long fall from the daily telegraph i'll tell you that but it's tabloid journalism it is nothing more than the fucking daily mail of classical music it is not journalism it's entertainment and it's very important to be treated as that the daily mail the sun all these fucking rags that's what slip disc is it's pure tabloid it's not well researched it's not quoting sources it's not unbiased it's just entertainment it's there to get your attention and to make you angry okay or in this case to let him vent his opinions now in slip disc i'm telling you lads go look at a couple of go look at 10 random articles you'll see there's spelling mistakes everywhere there's typos there's grammatical errors there's hyperlinks not working he just doesn't give a fuck he never did there's a worrying amount of mistakes he actually wrote a book and there's mistakes in the book constantly it's shocking now i most of the time with slip disc i will treat it the same way i treat tabloid shite it's entertaining but it's fun it can be fun most of it's harmless it's usually one it is it's one rich powerful white guy from the elite group shitting on other rich powerful white guys from the elite group doesn't really bother me too much to be totally honest they're gonna all fuck each other now sometimes it gets a bit annoying it gets a bit more sinister he's got this really strange obsession with yuja wang like seriously strange obsession Go on the slip disk, the website, go to the search function and type in Yuja and see how many fucking results you get. Like, I think I worked out he averages about six articles a month on Yuja Wang. Was he doing following her? There's 25 pages in the search results for Yuja Wang alone. He's obsessed with it and half of them are sly digs about her dress or the length of, yeah, the length of her dress or her legs being out or something like that. All bitchy as fuck. It does give like creepy as fuck vibes for a man of his age to be that obsessed with a young woman and especially about her fucking clothes and her her legs he's obsessed about it it's she's not gonna shag you all right mate she's not gonna fucking shag you do you know what it reminds me of it reminds me of fucking piers morgan how he goes after Meghan markle with a fucking vendetta all because we found out Meghan markle turned him down on a date years ago and now he's a fucking loser that gets obsessed about her it's creepy and weird and incelly i don't like it they're slimy fuckers but anyway i didn't like the break for that in the last year or so, it's turned way more sinister. What's going on with him? And, well, like a lot of people in the classical music industry, Liprecht is unashamedly pro-Israel. Now, this is where it becomes dangerous. Because he claims, and he puts it right on the banner, uh, he claims Slip this to be the number one classical music site, news site. Classical music news site. It's not news. You have to really fucking take this. Because that implies some kind of sense of journalistic integrity not the case okay now we spoke earlier about what journalistic integrity involves and the role the press has to at least try and present facts without bias the Brecht is fucking shit at that i'm going to show you loads of examples of this go on i did this lads fuck me go on the slip disc and search israel go do it you will get some fucking insane results now i'm going to show you these i'm going to read them out i haven't changed them at all they're right on my laptop here you can go search them i'm not making any of this up now, we're going to start with Jason Gillam. Now, Jason is a young Australian pianist who, in August, he gave a solo recital in Australia as part of a programme by the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Now, he was due to play a concerto then a couple of days after with that orchestra. So it was sort of like a teaser to sell tickets, essentially. He was doing a wee small recital. Now, in that recital, he played a contemporary piece of music. Uh, it was called Witness by a guy called Conor Donetto. Now, the composer himself had dedicated this piece to the journalists of Gaza. Now, Gillam, when he was introducing the piece, got up on stage and elaborated on this dedication and talked about, essentially, the 100 Palestinian uh, journalists that were killed, etc., etc. Now, he did this live. Now, we're going to look at how Lebrecht reacted to this news. So, the very first article he wrote, the headline, UK pianist is sacked for anti-Semitic rant. Now, we talked earlier, anti-Semitic and anti-Israel are not the same thing. You can't be anti-Semitic, you can't be anti-Israel. And you can criticise the Israeli government without being anti-Semitic. As said by some very respected institutions. So, anyway, uh, he says, the Australian-British pianist uh, Jason Gillam has been sanctioned by the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra after making remarks from the stage that were offensive to Israel and to Jews. Apparently, he speaks on behalf of all Jewish people and Israelis. Um... Gillam 37 had inserted a piece that was dedicated to Palestinian journalists killed in Gaza, in quotation marks, for whatever fucking reason. He is associated with multiple online propagandists on the pro-Hamas side of the conflict. Fuck me. 
Also, by the way, you'll notice I haven't said the word conflict once. There's no fucking conflict. Genocide is not a conflict, okay? Um, he says here, here's a further example, a further sample, sorry, of Gillum's naive public thinking, where Jason Gillum had an Instagram story saying, Australia will never begin to face the history of its settler colonial genocide if it cannot, cannot even acknowledge the one happening now in Palestine. Hashtag Gaza, Gaza genocide. Now, there's more articles about Jason. There's a lot of articles about Jason. Next headline, pro-pal pianist gets a slot on Australia's ABC. The anti-Israel propagandist Jason Gillam, who caused a crisis at the Melbourne Symphony, is telling his followers, and he says basically what goes on. Opponents are branding him Al Jay's Zero because of Jason Gillam. <laughs> this is journalism, lads. This is what we call journalism. Fucking dog shit. Next one. Now, what happened in this situation was the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra was sort of rescinded. They, they cancelled his concerto performance after what he said. They pulled out. Gillum went to sue them. They eventually brought him back for a concert. They regretted what they did and they brought him back. It was a whole thing about, you know, religious freedom, freedom of expression and stuff and employment laws. Okay, but whatever case, doesn't matter about the outcome of that. What happens is he did come back now. Here it is, the headline from Mr. Lebrecht. Orchestra caves in to piano activist. Uh, the press release below reports the rare capitulation of a symphony orchestra to the political bias of a solo pianist. It would be helpful if the MSO were to amplify the safety concerns that prompted the concert cancellation and its groveling apology to the propagandist, Jason Gillum. And then they give the quote that uh, the Melbourne Symphony released, the statement they released about bringing uh, Jason Gillum back. Fucking... This is another one. Melbourne shuns a pianist's absurd demands. The UK Australian pianist Jason Gillan provoked a crisis at the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra by making a contentious political statement with a hyperlink to his own fucking website because he's fucking shameless about the Middle East. Gil Hamas. That's what he says his name is. Gil Hamas was removed from his next scheduled appearance and the ensuing furor resulted in the sacking of the MSO's contentious MD, Sophie Gillies. The orchestra then tried to make good any harm it may have done to the headstrong pianist. Gillen presented a list of demands. Now, his demands were, and this is true, he wanted a public apology from the symphony orchestra, an affirmation of artist's rights to speak freely, compensation for alleged rep reputational damage caused by his consolation, future performance opportunities, and a commission of a piano concerto by a Palestinian composer, and a donation towards the Edward Said Conservatory of Music in Palestine. That's what Gillum asked the MBO for, the Melbourne, or MSO, sorry, M Melbourne Symphony Orchestra for. The MSO have told him to go whistle. That's how he ends it. Gil Hamas, can we just ha fucking take a second here to say, this is meant to be the number one classical music site, classical music news site, and he's using terms like that. That is not even an attempt to hide your bias. It is a fucking disgrace. It's unashamed. It's tabloid shit. Even if I agreed with that, which I obviously don't, but even if I agreed with that, that is piss poor journalism at its absolute... Like, that's a compliment. That Calling it piss poor journalism is an insult to piss poor journalism. That is a fucking disgrace to do that. It is a fucking disgrace. Not even an attempt. Next headline. Scotland hires anti-Israel pianist. I noticed he's dropped anti-Semitic because I actually commented on it when he put it on Facebook. I don't say a single thing that's anti-Semitic about this. To criticise the Israeli government is not to be anti-Semitic. As we pointed out earlier from a very fucking reputable source. So go fuck yourself. So we switched to anti-Israel as if anti-Israel is a bad thing. Be anti-Israel. You should be fucking anti-Israel. Anyway, again, provoked a crisis at the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra with an anti-Israel diatribe. Has been invited to join the staff of the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Fair play to the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, by the way. Up the boys. It's a country that knows what's fucking bread's buttered. Uh, the college will presumably keep an eye on some of his wilder teachings. Fuck up, you fucking goat. Now, it's not just Gillamy goes after, okay? I'll give you a few other things about Israel that the practice talked about. Here's a headline. A music director... I'm sorry. Fuck me, lads, this is hard today. A music director issues inflammatory Israel post. The following piece of propaganda has been posted by Lorenzo Viotti, departing music director of the Dutch National Opera. The impulsive Swiss conductor, impulsive hyperlinked, which we'll get to in a minute, whose image can be seen at the top of the post, might be required to explain his action. He has since taken the post down from his feet. What did Lorenzo Viotti post? He had, Israel is burning people alive in Rafa. Email your elected official. Fucking fair, fair petty, Lorenzo. Stand by in that. I really wish you didn't get pushed or deleted, but we know where you stand, and I stand with you, Lorenzo. Now, I said earlier, he's talking about a serious fucking crisis in the Middle East. No matter what side you're on, this is a horrendous crisis that's going on over there. It's the fucking worst of humanity right now. And this fucking cunt, right? He says, the impulsive Swiss conductor, hyperlinks impulsive, and the article you get when you click it, 
goes to Breaking, half-naked music director ends his Dutch outing and it's got a picture of Lorenzo Viotti without his top on. That is dog shit journalism. That is embarrassingly bad journalism. I fucking cringe at the fact that it even entered his mind to do this. Absolute fucking weapon. Absolute fucking weapon. And to be honest, here, lads, here's the last one on Norman Lebrecht, where we're going to get on to it. Um, you're all familiar with Daniel Barenboim, I'm assuming. Uh, obviously, Daniel Barenboim is one of the great conductors of all time. Um, now, what he's most well known for is he's an Israeli. Obviously, first he does hold other passports in different countries. But he founded the West Eastern Divan Orchestra. Now, anyway, he's not familiar with the West Eastern Divan Orchestra. It is a, essentially a peace project. It's an orchestra that has Palestinian and Israeli musicians playing together. He co-founded it with the Palestinian academic Edward Said, who's sadly passed away a long time ago now. He's got the Edward Said Academy of Music. He was a philosopher, academic, etc. So we had a Palestinian guy and an Israeli guy coming together to make an orchestra where they played together. It's a huge thing for peace. And it's one of the big... It's one of the few things that's came... Someone's came out of this, the whole thing and looked good. Like, it's one of the few genuine attempts at peace I've seen. And Daniel Barenboim is very fucking careful about what he says. But he went after him here. And I'm going to read you what he said because you're going to... It feels like I, I know the way I'm talking right now. You all think, oh, fuck, I should be wearing a tinfoil hat. He's fucking lost his mind. It's not. So I'm going I'm to read it in the phone. So Daniel Barnwell calls on Israel to lift siege of Gaza. That's the headline. First t- sentence, as usual. The veteran musician tonight issued a notably one-sided statement. I will tell you, this is not a one-sided fucking statement. This is in reference to the Hamas attacks on October 7th last year against Israel. This is not one-sided. Okay, it starts here. I followed the events of the weekend with horror and the utmost worries I see the situation in Israel-Palestine worsening to unimaginable depths. Hamas' attack on the Israeli civilian population is an outrageous crime which I condemn fiercely. Condemns fiercely, okay? Now he goes on to say, Edward Said and I always believe that the only path to peace between Israel and Palestine is a path based on humanism, justice, equality and an end of the occupation rather than military action. I find myself today grounded in this belief more strongly than ever. Blah, 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 blah. Now that is as down in the middle a fucking statement as you can make condemning in no uncertain terms the attacks and calling for peace purely okay he says here in these trying times and with these words i stand in solidarity with all the victims and their families daniel barnboy leading the way better man than i am now here's lebrecht barnboy makes no appeal to the gaza authorities release 150 innocent hostages including several children his bias has never been clearer in relation to the israel palestine conflict this ill-considered statement of his does nothing for the cause of peace or for the prospect of a ceasefire. As if Norman Lebrecht wants fucking peace. The dog shit he is writing. Now you think I'm losing my mind here. And I know you fucking do. But I'm going to show you. Once and for all how fucking insane this guy is. This is pure like propaganda. He throws that word about a lot. He loves throwing that about. This is propaganda. Slip Disc is a classical music website. It posts on classical music uniquely. Now I didn't notice. I found three articles recently when I looked up Israel that were nothing to do with classical music and I cannot find him reporting on things that have nothing to do with classical music in any other context unless it's Israel. So, this is the, um, these are real articles. I'm not fucking making this up. First article he posted last year. BBC News is a laughing stock on Israel TV and his only comment is very close to the bone. Now, under that you have an Israeli satirical program uh, basically taking the piss out of the BBC's coverage of the Middle East and what's going on over there being very pro-Israel and saying the Israeli, or the BBC is being too pro-Palestine. Now, why the fuck is a classical music article sharing this? A classical music news site, and he's posted on Slip Disc, not on his Facebook page, not on another publication. This is on Slip Disc. This has fuck all to do. I've watched the video, it's fucking dog shit as well, but that's my opinion. This has fuck all to do with classical music. Why is he sharing it? Why the fuck? I don't get it. It's not even an article. It's one, two, three, four, five words. Five fucking words and a link to something like... It's like a fucking dad sending you a WhatsApp message. Next one. Johnny Greenwood rejects silencing of Israeli artists. The Radiohead musician performed a concert in Tel Aviv last week with the Israeli artist Drudy Tassa and Arab musicians from other countries prompting calls for the BDS movement to join him for its boycott. Greenwood has published a sharp retort on his Twitter and YouTube. Now again, Johnny Greenwood from Radiohead. Fuck all to do with classical music. Why the fuck are you talking about this? There's nothing to do with... Nothing to do with classical music in the slightest. And again... Doesn't talk about it any other time. It's only released to Israel. He'll do these things. Here's another one. Israel's song is rained on by Eurovision. The Israeli entry for the next Eurovision Song Contest is titled October Rain. This was last year. The organizers apparently consider it political and consider it excluding it from the competition. Uh, artists in Sweden have called for Israel to be moved altogether. The new song is yet to be released. It's a hard rain's gonna fall. 
Again, what the fuck does that have to do with classical music? He only posts things that nothing to do with classical music when it's pro-Israel. If that isn't the most fucking biased, ridiculous journalism you have ever seen, I don't know what is. Like that, honestly, it makes the Daily Mail look good. It makes the Sun look good. It is a fucking travesty we don't have better news articles than this in classical music. I mean, it's not journalism, but it claims to be journalism. And that's the fucking problem. And he claims like he knows things. He's worked for BBC Radio 3 and all that kind of shit. And he claims like he's some fucking, fucking legitimate journalist. And he might well have been once at one time. This is dog shit. This is piss per He's a fucking clown. And considering the war crimes and the genocide Israel is committing right now, I can only think of three reasons why we so blindly pro-Israel. Right now, there's only three reasons why you'd be pro-Israel, in my opinion. One, you're suffering from religious psychosis. Two, you're in the pockets of Israel on some kind of level. Or number three, you're a fucking idiot. Now, number two, this is a thing. And this is the part of the podcast I, I'm a bit nervous about, lads. But we're going to get through it. So, I don't need my tinfoil hat. We're going to get to this now. There is a reason why so much of classical music is pro-Israel. Now, in general, you have to remember, Western world. Why is the Western world supporting Israel? Well, first of all, it created the state. Second of all, it's in the middle of the Middle East. It is an ally of the West. If the West loses Israel, it may lose the Middle East. Okay, so it's a huge ally to making sure that the Western dominance of the world stays in place. That's why the West and like you know, America and France and Germany and the UK are so intent on keeping Israel there because it is a way of controlling the Middle East. Western dominance will fall if it goes. Now, they... Well, that, that's not for me to even comment on because I don't have them educated enough to say anything but that's the reason why a lot of it is going towards the way a lot of politicians are doing it that way they're afraid of the Middle East getting out of hand I remember even Ronald Soares the oh fuck what role did he play but anyway he was uh, involved in the I'm going to find this uh, the British governor of Jerusalem in 1917-1926 and he said that even forming Israel was forming for England a little Jewish Ulster in a sea of potentially hostile Arabism now by that he means obviously Northern Ireland and Ulster which is an occupied state as well by the British and was divided up just by fucking painting lines wherever it went. The goal was to make sure that the British kept a presence in Ireland. Now, he's admitted that, so we know what this is for. But anyway, that's why the general Western world is staying pro-Israel. Classical music. Now, we're going to go to a story about this to highlight my point. Way back in 2011, right, four members of the London Philharmonic Orchestra signed a petition to have the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra banned from performing at the BBC Proms in London. Now, the BBC, uh, the, the LPO found out about this and suspended them for six months without pay. Saying, basically saying they can't use their, they can't share their political views using the orchestra's name. Because in the petition beside their names was LPO listed beside us. Now, there was very little media coverage in this, okay? And the rumour has, now the rumour has said that the orchestra had placed a gagging order on the four musicians and their families. Now, the only interviews regarding this whole fucking mess was from the chief executive at the time of the LPO, Timothy Walker. Now, he said the only reason we're doing this is because they put LPO after their names. Now, what he did not mention is that one of the four musicians did not put her affiliation, she just put her name. He knew that that name had been mistakenly added by someone else who had immediately taken full responsibility for the error she was suspended anyway. So that makes a fucking joke of this guy's claim that the musicians were not being punished for their views. It's a fucking joke, okay? Nor did he tell the media that in a in personal capacity only disclaimer that all signatories have been inadvertently admitted by the professor, not a musician, who submitted the letter to the independent. This too, the management knew it. Now, why did the orchestra management withhold these facts from the media when they could have diffused the issue? This could have helped everything. Perhaps Mr. Walker himself let the reason slip out when he told the BBC, the Times, and the Telegraph, and I quote, some Jewish supporters had threatened to withdraw financial support from the LPO. And there we fucking have it, lads. Like so many orchestras in the UK, especially, who rely on private sector funding as opposed to government funding, they're terrified of going anti-Israel because of their fucking pockets. Now, I know I sound like a madman here, okay? But you're gonna have to bear with me in this. I went to the LPO website. Now, on the LPO website, you can go down and see the list of all their sponsors, donors, friends of the orchestra. It's brilliant. They've got it all there. Now, they do definitely highlight in there as well that not all people are on it. Some people wish to remain anonymous. But when I was reading through this list, two in particular stood out. Now, firstly, Bloomberg are one of the main sponsors over at the LPO. I'm sure you're all familiar with Bloomberg, financial software data and media company based in the US. Now, they're a fucking massive company. Now, they were ran for a very, very, very long time, I think up until 2023, by Mike Bloomberg. You might know him, former New York City mayor, 
openly pro-Israel guy. Very openly pro-Israel. Go and give that a Google. See the kind of money he has sent to Israel and the money he hasn't sent anywhere else. And see that. So, this is not tinfoil hat stuff. They are one of the major sponsors of the LPO. You think when this happened, Bloomberg weren't on the fucking phone saying that you guys make this go away. Otherwise, your money's getting fucked. And again, UK orchestras rely so heavily on private funding. It's not like Germany where the state funds it. Like, as much. Now, the next one. This didn't stand out at first. There was a connection to my brain doing this and I thought fuck or something about this and then I researched a bit further and found out I got to the bottom of it one of the sponsors is probably Natixis now Natixis I'm probably pronouncing that Natixis that probably is how you say it in French or Natixis it's a French multinational financial services firm specialised in asset and wealth management corporate and investment banking insurance and payments now that's a quote from their website now they are part of a bigger group and it's a group called BPCE which is a massive banking group in France fucking massive i think they're the 19th biggest banking group in the world they're the fifth biggest in france which is obviously a massive banking nation in itself these are a huge group it was actually between i think it was kiss Epernay and someone else joined together to make the bbc anyway massive 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 banking group okay now i found a fun little article about them when you search them several organizations published a report today on french banks dangerous liaisons with the israeli settlements under enterprise the report highlights the links between certain French banks and insurance companies and Israeli banks and businesses involved in maintaining and developing the Israeli settlements. Now, essentially, these banks were providing huge loans to Israeli electric companies, construction companies, various other companies involved in the illegal settlements. I say illegal. The UN have confirmed the illegality of these settlements. The Israeli settlements, they are illegal. Very clearly. Especially the ones in East Jerusalem. Now, Again, Natixis is one of the sponsors of the LPO. You can see why they'd be quite fucking reluctant to let some of the musicians criticise Israel in any way. Now, I wish I had more news in the LPO 4, as they were branded at the time. It's hard to actually find information on it. I know one of the most vocal ones is now retired, and she's very pro-Israel, in, or pro-Israel, pro-Palestine, sorry. She's very pro-Palestine in her views on Twitter. She's great. But I'm not sure entirely how it all ended up. I struggle to find any articles on it. I don't know if that's because of a gag in order or just my lack of research. So on that one, if that's my fault, that's my fault, lads, okay? Again, unlike Norman Lebrecht, I'm not claiming to be a source of journalism in the slightest, okay? I'm telling you my opinion everything. I'm giving you a full disclaimer and saying I am biased. So do not listen to me as an unbiased source of information. I'm not claiming to be a news source. I'm giving you my opinion on things. And I'm bringing things to your attention. So, lads, I have loads of this. I have loads of this stuff. Like, this is, not, this is scratching the surface. And I am planning a further episode on it. This is what I threw together for tonight. This is the quickest I can get this all together. And I just needed to get this off my chest. I love classical music. I love the music. The industry can be fucking rotten to the core. Rotten. And this week, honestly, lads, it was too much. It's too much for me. So, you have to remember, if you're even... If you're doing this industry as a professional, or if you're doing it as a hobby, either or, you are fucking privilege to be involved in this you're fucking privileged that you have the time money and security in your life to be able to go and play a fucking instrument if you're getting paid for it you're especially privileged because it is not a job that matters okay i say that as a musician we're not lifesavers we're not doing anything important it is the epitome of privilege to be able to go out and play a fucking flute and get paid for it and that's your job okay we could be doing things a lot more difficult so remember your privilege you don't have to feel bad about it remember you're so privileged even to be doing this as a hobby even the fact that you can listen to this podcast freely on your spare time that is a privilege do not take it for granted and maybe use it as a chance to reflect on what's really important at the minute it was my turn to do this this week okay there are some classical musicians out there who are doing amazing work for different causes within the classical music industry i want to go and interview them all i want to talk to them about them all because all these causes are very important in my opinion this right now this situation is way more important than anything else it's more important than the racism right than classical music the sexism right the homophobia right all those scandals this trumps them all because these are human lives and a shitload of human lives what's that thing spock says the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few right now i think as classical musicians is our duty to start changing this industry start talking about it if you're an activist for something else if you've been pro-palestine fucking talk about it don't hide away on it lads I put a call out on my Instagram for more pro-Palestine musicians. I found a lot of really good ones. I'm going to try and figure out a way to get all their opinions sort of rolled into one episode. I am doing my best to get a player from the Divine Orchestra as well on. to talk about this. I've got a few irons in the fire. It's very hard, okay? A lot of people are very scared to talk about this, not just because of repercussions, but also it's an incredibly emotive topic for anyone directly related to it. The closest I have got is the attack, or potential attack, or threatened attack on 
Irish UN peacekeepers today. Apart from that, I'm still over in my first world country in my flat, safe and sound away from it all. So I, even I'm emotional about this, and this is really nothing to fucking do with me in a direct sense. So, guys, anyway, I'll be back next week. There'll probably be a lighter episode next week, and I'll be in better headspace, and we'll get to that, okay? And it'll be a little bit of rest, by because I know a lot of you come to this podcast for a distraction from the world and the media and what's going on, and I understand that, and I'm sorry that you didn't get that this week. I really am. But I will be back for that, okay? So, lads, ladies, all in between, uh, go and look after yourselves. Be gentle yourselves. Be gentle to one another. Go kiss a dog. Go stroke a cat. Text your ma. And also, don't be afraid to speak out, okay? Even just stick a wee Palestine and a Lebanon emoji in your bio. Share a picture. Get involved a wee bit. There you go. Do it for me. Normalize it. If you normalize it, we'll all do it. So, lads, this podcast has to come out in three hours, not even. I'm away to have a sit down. It's been it's been lovely talking to you directly, and I'll be back next week. Look after yourselves. Mwah.